before Inception, before The Matrix, and before Strange Days came Brainstorm, a 1983 movie involving nightmares, forgotten dreams, lost love, and a mysterious, tragic death. But that wasn't just in front of a camera. Brainstorm is intriguing, disturbing, and well, a little confusing. But it's also kind of cool. So before we look at this one, let's mention that this was Natalie Wood's last movie. She tragically died in 1981 from a mysterious drowning incident during a break in filming. Taking place on a boat while her husband Robert Wagner and Brainstorm co-star Christopher Walken were both on board. Her death halted the movie and very nearly ended it entirely. But whilst that's the biggest drama surrounding Brainstorm, it's not the only one, something we'll cover in much more detail later. So with that in mind, let's dive in, oh, I mean, let's talk about the movie. You're gonna spoil the whole thing. The movie starts with this pretty visually impressive opening, almost psychedelic and hypnotic. This movie was directed by Douglas Trumbull, who created the visual effects for 2001 A Space Odyssey, Blade Runner, and Star Trek for Motion Picture. The actual idea for Brainstorm started way back in 1973, and we actually got as far as being ready to film, but then the studio came in and shut the whole thing down, due to some financial trouble. The composer of the movie is James Horner, and there's a couple of key points in the soundtrack that I think sound a lot like Wrath of Khan or Aliens. Take a listen. So we come to the end of the title sequence and we get some trippy camera angles and a really nice shot of the lab with some neat 80s computers and hardware, along with a brief introduction to the chain-smoking Dr. Lillian Reynolds, played by Louise Fletcher, or as I like to call her, Kai Wynn. Your pie is strong, my child. The contraptions on my head are pretty cool. I found out they're called Superconducting Phased Field Neuro Discharge Sensor Arrays. <laughs> I love sci-fi techno babble. This is the isopalavial interface which controls the main ferromantle drive unit. Don't touch that. And although this was a year earlier, I can't help but be reminded of a colander hat from Ghostbusters. Do I? Yes, have some. Yes, have some. So we're basically explained that these scientists have developed a system that allows the recording and playback of a person's memories, senses, and experiences onto a type of sparkly videotape. Our main protagonist is Michael Brace, played by Christopher Walken. Here I am, I'm naked. I'm naked. He's wired into this idiot called Gordy, so he should be able to feel exactly the same sensations. But this Gordy being a prick, he eats some disgusting food and then makes him listen to some really loud noise. Then the dumbass thinks it would be funny to swap his headset with his ape, which makes Walken look like he's jerking off. Can you say erection? <laughs> Despite Gordo being a complete asshole, there's something wrong with you. You know that? Their test is a success and they celebrate their breakthrough. Walken then cycles home on this weird-ass bike. He arrives home to a group practicing in his living room. This would weird me out, honestly. We then meet his wife, played by Natalie Wood, and there's some noticeable tension in the air. We also meet his son, who looks ginger. I'd get a DNA test, pal. They all then meet with a head of a company, played by Spider-Man's Uncle Ben. I am on my ass. And he's all like, I want you to knock my socks off. He then gives him a new computer chip to make things run better, but surely that would have been more helpful earlier on? Yes. And then back home again. I told you to get out of the pool. He plays the hotel. I'll get him. Oh, I think you better stay away from the water, love. Have you no decency? 
Okay. Some potential yeah. buyers come to look around my house. And Morgan says that he can't live there anymore. I can't stay here now. So she's like... You could go live over at the center. Lillian's there. We then get a bit of a montage of Gordog being a dumbass again. He's recording some different experiences, like being in a jet plane, motor car, horseback riding, and a water slide. They then work on making the whole thing smaller, so they don't have to wear this whack off thing on their heads. Uncle Ben then has a preview. And he's all like, You blew my socks off. They then give a demo to the division ends. And they're playing a risky game. Look at how old some of these fuckers are. She could have a heart attack. <laughs> anyway, they play some pretty good clips. And some really good clips, eh? <laughs> Come on, this guy's loving it. I'm not a pervert. These two guys then talk about the military application of a headset. About um, military application. It's wide open. And the other one hands him a sandwich, which he doesn't eat. I mean, I don't blame him. That is a weak ass sandwich. It's a huge shit sandwich. Kaiwin and Walken then attend a party, and Walken's wife is there, with her partner, I think? Why do you still see him? Because he's a perfectly wonderful, thoughtful, uncreative guy. They then get brought upstairs to a meeting with a captain, a colonel, and some Andy Warhol lookalike. Uh, my name is Andy Warhol, and uh, I just finished eating uh, a hamburger. Dr. Wynn then gets pissed off because she hates the military, so she storms out. I don't get it. Later on, they ambush her again. Down. Alex, please, you promised you wouldn't do this. He's a spy for the feds. And I don't want to see it end up on some defense scrap heap before we know what it's really about. And then she goes and cries, and has a bit of a breakdown in the ladies' room. You're gonna spoil the whole thing! It's the ladies' room! This idiot Gordy then gives their buddy Hal one of the reels that he's recorded, which is basically a porno of him screwing some woman. Probably his own cousin. Natalie Wood then tries on one of her headsets and records some of her memories. Walken then plays back for real and finds that she's been remembering some of the bad experiences from their relationship. House, the kid, the car, the whole goddamn thing. I don't want any. I'll live in a hotel. This is where we get a lot of clips of their relationship and we get a better understanding of why they separated. I want to ride my bike, big deal. You take it, his pants are full. You could put flowers all around it. I don't know what you're so upset about. You have a problem, don't you? It's called Limp Dick. <laughs> that one shouldn't be in there. The Strangle! Walken then comes home and gives Natalie a film reel. She plays it, and we get this really nice montage of them living their lives together, with this fitting score from James Horner. This scene's really put together well, and I can't help but think it makes the viewer think about the memories perhaps they'd like to relive if they could. Since they share their memories together, they start to kind of bond again, and then their relationship is reignited. So much for Mr. Uncreative. They then get a phone call, and it turns out that Hal, who got that skin flick reel off of Gordo, is at risk of jerking himself to death.
Vulcan disconnects him, but he gets a little bit violent. Come here, Michael. Come here out of the chamber. <laughs> and then they put him on a treadmill. I don't know where I'm getting all this energy. <laughs> Maybe because you've been cyber screwing for the past few days. Kiss me. Honestly. <laughs> Honestly, you haven't been off this machine in a month. He then says that he's quitting because they've given him disability leave. Hell, the good folks at the uh, lab are paying me disability leave of indeterminate duration. Why? Has he masturbated his own dick off? Probably wore it down to the bone. So, kind of out of the blue, Kai Wynn starts to feel really shitty. Like she's having some sort of heart attack. Hell, maybe she's been watching one of those porno reels. Can you say erection? <laughs> Knocking everything over, she wheels herself over to the tape deck and manages to put the headset on. Oh, sorry, the superconducting phased field narrow discharge sensor array. And she manages to upload something of herself onto the machine before she dies. Walken then tries to play Dr. Wynn's reel. But it's a bit intense. So he pokes it with a few chips and then tries again. At the same time in another room, Andy Warhol tells Gordy to try it too. He does, but he starts to really freak out. Walken then experiences some of the memories off the reel. And it's of them sort of stacking cola cans, a surprise birthday party. But also, he sees a conversation that Triad is dead. Whatever that means. Last year they said it's over. Triad is over, don't you understand, Lillian? Walken then starts to have a bad reaction. And he ends up getting hospitalized. The idea of playing that tape is sick. I want these personal experiments stopped. You've abused your responsibility. So, with Kai Wynn now dead, Andy Warhol starts to take over running the lab. And he forces Walken out. He's understandably pissed off about it. Take your hands off that. You can lock it up, but you can't make it work. Get off it. Go on, get off. All of you, get out. You've no right to be here. It's my lab. No. I'm sorry, Mike. But he goes to the lab and sees that it's all automated. Pretty high tech for 1981. Walken then starts to dance with some aliens. Oh, wait, that's the wrong movie. He actually meets up with Hal, who's like... You really had us worried, Mike. Hal, aren't you the one that would jerking yourself into oblivion? You know what I always wanted to be? A porn star? He is not a porn star! They then work on a scheme to get access to the lab again because Walken wants to finish playing Dr. Wynn's reel. I have to get back into the computer. It's illegal. Wouldn't want you to get in trouble, Hal. Walken then hacks into the lab and gets some top-level access to some really bad shit. Psychotic episode? Toxic session hemorrhaging spiders? Shit, that sounds terrifying. He then plays the reel and he gets a warning from Andy Warhol telling him there's some bad shit here. You have five seconds to terminate this tape. The artist who made Campbell's tomato soup cans. Walken plays it for a second and he's all like. We're leaving. His ginger son then comes across the headset. Oh, the superconducting phased field narrow discharge sensor array. Anyway, the little dipshit tries it on and he gets some weird vision involving his dad tying him to a chair. Which I'm a little confused about. I thought these were meant to be memories or experiences from people. Also, where are the hemorrhaging spiders? I don't know. Regardless, he then gets hospitalized. Walken then starts to get probed by some alien. Oh shit, it's the wrong movie again. While they're at the hospital, they find out that poor Gordy has died. Have you seen Gordy? No. He's dead. Good riddance to bad rubbish. Oh well, 
Mimi and Gon may then go on a trip, despite the fact that their son's brain has just been fried. Yeah, that's not weird. Shortly after they arrive, Wood and Walken start to argue. About, come sit at the Hi, don't do out. that! You go to hell. You go to hell too. You go to hell! You go to hell too. Don't push me. You go to hell too. You go to hell. You go to hell. She leaves. Good thing they're not on a boat. <laughs> and, and then we see her getting out of a taxi with suitcases. They then start having a phone call. And we find out that the whole argument was actually a ruse. And it's really just to throw them off the scent. While Walken hacks into the system again. I'm, I'm going to stay a few days. Walken then starts to make all the automated stuff go nuts. Throwing packing peanuts everywhere. And this poor guy slips. These weird things look like they're straight from TNG. Anyway, Walken starts to play Dr. Kywin's reel, and I can't help but think all of this could have been a lot easier if she'd have just told him this in person. Anyway, we get some pretty cool visuals for 1983. The lab is then locked out, and Andy Warhol can't get in, and the automated process starts to go apeshit. They then cut Walken's phone call off to Natalie Wood, and he loses his connection to the lab. Cut Brace's phone. Arrest him. Yes, sir. Walken then leaves his hotel room. This is when we get some serious aliens music, like I mentioned earlier. Brace. But he almost gets stopped by some goons. But he doesn't give a shit, and he nearly mows them down in his truck. I don't drive too good. <laughs> Now the production line's all foamed up, causing a load of shit. And I feel like this is when the movie starts to fall apart a little. Vulcan then decides to go to where the Wright brothers had their first flight. Why? I don't know. But he taps into the phone line using his 80s computer. He then starts to play Dr. Kai Wins Reel again, while Andy Warhol and his goons try to break down the door. They start to try and trace Walken's call, and we get to see some of the footage that he's playing. I mean, why would you want to play this? It's fucking creepy. So somehow Natalie Wood finds him here. How? I don't know. Well, we do get some pretty amazing space scenes at least. And then Walken collapses, and I think we're supposed to think he's dead. I mean, she must have known this was a risk. Mike! Mike! You promised me! You promised me! Mike! We made a deal! But she keeps talking to him, and he eventually wakes up. And suddenly, we get the end credits. So yeah, we're left with a lot of unanswered questions. Did he learn anything from watching the reel? What happened to the company? Their research? Is their son okay? Did Hal become a porn star? What happened to Uncle Ben? <laughs> oh yeah. It's all very abrupt, really. I don't know what you're so upset about. Supposedly, this isn't how the movie was supposed to end, but due to Natalie Wood's death, the ending had to be constructed from scenes that were shot earlier. And interestingly, screenwriter Robert Snitzel claims that Walken and Wood were both drunk when they shot this scene. So, let's talk a little bit about Natalie Wood's death. At this point in her career, Wood hadn't worked in about two years. And according to sources prior to filming, she went on a crash diet to lose some weight, but then started to gain it back from heavy alcohol consumption. During a break in filming Brainstorm, Wood was on her husband's motor yacht. 
On board was her co-star Christopher Walken, the boat's captain, and her husband Robert Wagner. They were all taking a trip to Santa Catalina Island. According to Wagner, at around 10.45pm, Wood went to their cabin to sleep, while he continued talking to Walken. Wagner then went into the cabin some time later and found Wood was gone. They searched the yacht and also found that a dinghy was missing. They contacted Harbour Patrol, albeit some hours later, who found Wood in the early hours of the morning, around one mile away from the yacht. Now, that might all seem fairly clean cut, but there's a lot more controversy concerning her death. There was a claim that Walken heard Wood and Wagner fighting, as well as some of the fellow nearby sailors who also heard arguing and shouting for help. Her autopsy report from a reopened case in 2011 suggested that she had bruising on her ankle, knees and wrists, which were prior to her entering the water. There were also medication in her bloodstream used to treat pain and motion sickness, as well as alcohol. There are conflicting accounts as to whether Walken and Wood had an affair during filming. In the documentary Natalie Wood, What Remains Behind, Brainstorm director Douglas Trumbull said, There was a love scene between the two of them, a sex scene actually. And I found out in the shooting of that scene that there was almost no physical charisma between them at all. And so that made me believe in retrospect now that the suggestion that there was some love triangle between Natalie and Christopher and RJ or something like that, whatever anybody would make of it, is not true. I just think it's impossible. But according to a 2019 interview with a Projection Booth podcast, screenwriter Robert Snitzel said, Trumbull was not a director, and I think a large part of that was because of the Walken Wood affair that they were having on the set and it was disruptive. I would hear stories where the AD would come to the trailer and say, you know, Mr. Walken, you're wanted on the set, and he'd be in there screwing Natalie, and they'd be both laughing, and Walken would say, well, tell Dougie we'll be out when you're out, you know. I do think that their affair really kind of superseded the movie, you know, and when I look back at it, and it ultimately led to Wood's death indirectly. I knew about the affair. Everyone connected with the movie knew about the affair. I'm sure Wagner knew about it. Exactly what, what went on on that boat would be anyone's guess. But the official version that we have so far, I know is not accurate. Something else went on there uh, than what's been written so far. Walken himself has been reluctant to talk about the incident. But in a 1983 EW interview for Brainstorm, he said... The real story of her death is that she um, drowned and uh, nobody knows uh, how she drowned or what happened except uh, her. However, the press kept pressing and in a 1986 profile interview for People magazine, Walken seemed annoyed when Wood's death was brought up. He said, I don't know what happened. She slipped and fell in the water. I was in bed then. It was a terrible thing. Look, we're in a conversation I won't have. It's a fucking bore. Despite Wood having already completed most of her major scenes, MGM, who at the time were having some mounting financial problems, took Wood's death as an opportunity to shut down an already troubled production. Trumbull said, When she died, all the sets were locked and frozen on all the stages. No one could get in or out without special permission while all the negotiations took place. When MGM refused to pay for the film to be completed, Lloyds of London provided £2.7 million for Trumbull to complete principal photography and an additional $3.5 million towards post-production. Meanwhile, other studios showed interest in buying Brainstorm from MGM so they could release it as their own production. Trumbull proceeded to complete the film by rewriting the script and using Natalie Wood's younger sister, Lena, for Wood's few remaining scenes. Respectfully as well, he cut some of the scenes out that involved Wood in a pond and a pool. 
Unfortunately, due to Trumbull's overwhelming negative experience, he refused to work in Hollywood ever again, stating, It actually became the most difficult thing I've ever had to do to get that movie finished, and so it never really was anything it was intended to be. I just had to stop. I'd been a writer-director all my life, and I decided it wasn't for me because I was put through a really challenging personal experience. I do not think the story has ever been told. I don't know the story myself, but I know what my experience was. I decided to leave the movie business. Trumbull went on to make some motion-based simulators, such as the Back to the Future rides for Universal, as well as some smaller versions for science museums. As I mentioned earlier, the composer for Brainstorm was James Horner, who's gone on to have a fantastic career as a composer. But Brainstorm's soundtrack actually won him a Saturn Award for Best Music in 1983. It was originally conceived that this movie would be shot on Showscan, at 60 frames per second, 70mm film process. The intention was to give it a more real and high impact reality. However, MGM backed out of the plans to use the new format. Trumbull instead shot all of the virtual sequences at 24 frames per second, Super Panavision 70, with an aspect ratio of 2.2 to 1. The rest of the film was shot in conventional 35mm, with an aspect ratio of approximately 1.7 to 1. This meant that in theatres, the taped sequences are a bit wider on the screen and have more deeply saturated colours. Brainstorm, a new dimension in motion picture entertainment. The movie was finally released in September 1983, almost two years afterwards death. It opened only on a small number of screens, with very little publicity. Despite being unofficially tagged as Natalie Wood's last movie, the film was unfortunately not a commercial success. Given her choice, I doubt if Natalie Wood would have chosen this picture as her final monument. With a production budget of 18 million, and only grossing 10 million in ticket sales in North America. And that's basically it for Brainstorm. It's not a great movie, but it's not a bad one either. After all, it's Christopher Walken. What more could you ask for? Well, I guess so. Hi, Christopher Walken here. Well, what can I say? I hope you've enjoyed this video, but be sure to help out the channel by subscribing, liking the video, and by commenting below. Thanks for watching, have a great day, and hey, BMX is his world. Rad is his way of life. He's got the style. There's something about the way you rap so much. And he's going to prove it. Against the factory hotshot. Everyone on his case. I want to ride my bike. Big deal. Rad.